Good evening, one and all. To understand the section 141 to 143, practically from a person like Justice V. Ram Kumar, whose sessions we always, always say are always being well received on the social media as well as on the WhatsApp, we keep on receiving the messages that his style of illustrating the aspects is so valid to be understand in the minds. They keep on requesting that we should request. And as we already said that Justice Ram Kumar, despite challenges in the life, he continues to share his knowledge. And before we going, were going live, still he was saying that he will continue to share his knowledge. And that brings us, us here. And I'll ask Mr. S.K. Prem Menon, he's also from Kerala, and he has been connected with us for quite a long time, to give some deep, deeper insights about Justice V. Ram Kumar and today's session. Or do you, uh, S.K. Prem? I'm audible, right? Yes, very much. <laughs> a very good evening to all of you. Good evening. Uh, so today's topic, I think it's a much needed one. Though mainly as Vikas has put it, we are concerned with just three sections of the Evidence Act, namely 141, 142, and 143. Now, this is a very vital and extensive topic. And of course, Section 154 also, along with Section 145, can creep in, which I shall add to a bit later. And of course, technically, one can even say that the whole chapter can come into play. Now, as the term suggests with regard to this uh, particular topic, leading question does just what it says. It leads the person towards the answer. Now, it often encourages like a one-word answer like yes or no. And this can be advantageous to the person who puts the question, while it can be very, very unfair to his adversary. Because the very purpose of a chief examination, that is to enable a particular witness to testify before a court in his own words, rather than putting words into his mouth all these relevant facts from the case, he has to testify in his own words, and that too voluntarily. Now, answer should never be suggested, and the question should not be so framed to suggest any answer, because the question can never contain or carry an inbuilt answer, which we see as a leading question. And the key characteristics of a leading question uh, are that, uh, one is that they are deliberately framed to cultivate a, some sort of bias in the answering party so that the answers are according to the questionnaire's strategy. At times, such questions could have even elements of conjectures or assumptions. And uh, they mainly thrive on the answering party's input. Now, there can be connected leading questions also, interconnected. If I could just give an example to Moldova. Now, if somebody would ask, was the silver colored vehicle driven by Suanso speeding above 80 kilometers an hour when you first saw it at such and such place at such and such time? Kindly see what is the hidden danger? A yes, that could address the questionnaire's whole version of what is asked. And if these type of questions they are permitted in the chief examination, the lawyer, that particular uh, that particular lawyer is putting something into the mouth of the witness so that he can build a story that could well suit his client. So a fair trial of an accused, that would be hardly impossible if the prosecution can ask leading questions to a witness on a material part of evidence as against an accused. Now, on this particular topic, we have uh, definitions and uh, extensive commentaries also of the British jurists like Sir uh, John Woodruff, then uh, you have uh, the definition of Jeremy Bentham. So James Stephen, who authored the Evidence Act, which was originally passed in India by the Imperial Legislative Council in 1872. And Justice Ram Kumar, of course, as I'm sure, would be dealing with that in detail. And of course, coming to the statutory provisions, Section 141 that defines the leading questions as to questions which are suggestive of the answers. 142, that of course explains when they must not be asked. Of course, it carves out certain exceptions. And 143 explains us when they may be asked. And section 154 also, that deals with the situation when the court may, in its discretion, permit the party, the person who calls that particular witness, to put questions which he might ask in the cross-examination. Now, there are certain leading decisions by the Supreme Court, like uh, Worky Joseph, uh, 1983. I don't remember the exact page number. 
by the Supreme Court. Uh, that was, I think, it was Justice Ramaswamy, which is a leading decision on this point, which again was reiterated and rather explained in that Manu Sharma's case, which we popularly known as Jatiklala murder case of 2010, AR 2010 Supreme Court 2352. And uh, now with regard to the uh, with regard to Justice Ram Kumar, I would say. In my perception, Justice Ram Kumar, he believes in and follows uh, the renowned Scottish evangelist and the lecturer by name Henry Drummond, who had uh, whose quote is very famous, that I will never rise to the point of view which wishes to raise faith to knowledge. To me, the way of truth is to come through the knowledge of my ignorance to the submission of faith. And then making that my starting place to raise my knowledge into faith. And Justice Ram Kumar, according to me, is a most eminent and excellent teacher who has been lending his helping hand to educate all the young lawyers. So the audience is uh, impatiently, they are waiting for your valuable address. Now the platform is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. So the first question is, what is meant by a leading question? As, as was stated by Mr. Premraj Menon, the, the topic of leading questions in the context of examination of witnesses is dealt with under sections 141 to 143 of the Indian Evidence Act, 1872. Now, uh, I don't propose to go into the historical aspect or the, the pre-statutory position because my purpose is only to, only to emphasize, to, to inculcate what exactly these three sections mean to a practicing lawyer, to a presiding judge, etc. So what is meant by a leading question? Section, you get the answer in section 141 of the Evidence Act. It defines the meaning of a leading question. Any question, as rightly put by Mr. Premraj, suggesting the answer which the person putting it or wishes, which the person putting it wishes or expects to receive is called a leading question. I put a question and I expect an answer. So I expect a positive answer, a, an affirmative answer. So I frame my question in such a way that the answer is there in the question itself. I'm putting it into the mouth of the witness so that I get the answer which I expected. That is what is called leading question. Yes, question number two. Uh, when can a leading question be asked as a matter of right? Leading questions can be asked as a matter of right during cross-examination as permitted by Section 143 of the Evidence Act. Even during chief examination, leading questions can be asked on matters which are introductory or undisputed or which have, in the opinion of the court, have been direct, uh, sufficiently proved as permitted by the latter limb of Section 142 of the Evidence Act. Now, I'll give you an illustration. Just an illustration. The prosecution case is that one Vijay was murdered by the accused Rajesh by inflicting fatal stab injuries on his chest. The accused denies the whole prosecution version. According to the prosecution, PW1 is the only eyewitness to the occurrence. The public prosecutor in chief examination, the examination in chief, asks PW1 the following questions. First question is, have you come to give evidence in this case in which Vijay, the deceased, died as a result of sustaining stab injuries? This is the question. What is the purpose of your coming to this court? Have you come to give evidence regarding the death of Vijay as a result of sustaining stab injuries? Now, this question, though a leading question, cannot be objected to because it is introductory or undisputed because it is a fact that there is no, it is permissible because the fact that Vijay died as a result of uh, stab injuries is not uh, disputed even by the accused. He only disputes the alleged role attributed to him as the offender, as the culprit. Therefore, this question cannot be objected to. Now, yes, yet another question is asked by the public prosecutor. Have you not seen the accused inflicting stab injuries on deceased Vijay? Did you not see Vijay? Uh, Rajesh inflicting stab injuries on Vijay. This is a, an out and out leading question because accused is denying his, his complicity in the occurrence. 
So, which this is not admissible under, under Section 142 of the Evidence Act. The public prosecutor was putting answers into the mouth of PW1 by putting this question to him. Now, if this question was not objected to by the defense counsel, then strictly speaking, going by the wording of Section 142, this question is admissible under the uh, first limb of Section 142 of the Evidence Act. This is because there is a this is because of the fact that there is a larger principle founded on the Latin maxim, vigilantibus et non dormantibus jura subvenient. That is, the law expects only those who are vigilant and not those who sleep over their rights. Because if the defense counsel is sleeping over his rights and does not promptly take exception to a leading question implicating him, then he, he will have to suffer that. The, the law helps only those who are vigilant. Now, a classic illustration of this uh, principle in civil law is the law of adverse possession. You are, all of you know that if I, I um, if, if somebody else trespasses upon my property, I see him trespassing. I don't object. He remains in my property, settles down in my property for more than 12 years, during which time I don't object. After the expiry of 12 years, he prescribes an adverse title against me. He becomes the title holder and my title is extinguished under section, by the operation of section 27 of the Limitation Act. This is a clear case of vigilante bus. So he was never vigilant in, in maintaining, safeguarding his rights. Likewise, if the defense counsel does not object, the, the, the leading question being asked, incriminating him, then he will have to suffer that answer. And suppose, when a leading question which is not appropriate, he is not objected to. The adverse party may have to suffer the answer given in response to such leading question. But even here, there may be cases where the adverse party does not promptly object to a leading question, either due to ignorance or due to inexperience. We come across very many cases, especially in state briefs, crown, crown briefs. The, the court may appoint a, a comparatively junior lawyer to defend the accused. Maybe in a, it's a murder case. Now, he, due to his inexperience or ignorance, he may not promptly uh, object to the leading question being asked, uh, implicating his client. Now, in such cases, the court can come to the rescue of the party in trouble in order to ensure fair trial. Fair trial flows from Article 21 of the Constitution of India. There is a judge-made convention that when a child witness is being examined, even the adverse party is not, as of right, entitled to put leading questions in view of the vulnerabilities of such a witness due to want of sufficient maturity. In all such cases, the court is not expected to be a silent spectator, but should be a dynamic functionary. In order to ensure fair trial, the court should intervene in exercise of its power under Section 165 of the Evidence Act. As you all know, the only functionary in the whole gamut of criminal trial who can ask irrelevant question is the presiding judge. No other person can ask an irrelevant question. Neither the public prosecutor nor the defense lawyer. The judge alone can ask an irrelevant question. If you closely read section 165 of the Evidence Act. If instead of instead the letter of law is allowed to triumph in such a case when a leading question is asked, justice may suffer. These are situations when the court can make meaningful interventions in the interest of justice. May I read question number three. Uh, what does the prohibition against asking leading question operate? When does? Leading questions, if objected to by the adverse party, should not be asked during chief examination or in re-examination, except with the permission of the court. As Mr. Premraj Meron mentioned, the permission contemplated is section 154 of the Evidence Act. When we, deal, when we were dealing with hostile witness, we saw that when a party calls a particular witness, his own party, his own witness turns hostile, unfriendly, disloyal to the party himself, then the party can seek permission of the court under section 154 of the Evidence, of the evidence Act to put questions which might be put in cross-examination by the adverse party. 
mind you it is not cross examination see the beautifully the beautifully couched section the permission of the court is to obtain uh, uh, to put questions which might be put in cross examination by the adverse party so it is not cross examination during chief examination if a permission is sought under section 154 what is what the uh, the examination the continued examination is only chief examination not cross examination so that is uh, the pro the the prohibition of, of applies only when the question is objected to by the opposite side yes question number 4 uh, is not the public prosecutor entitled to put question to a prosecution witness to enable the witness to give answers in the form of yes or no so as to elicit material part of the evidence which the prosecutor wishes or expects already seen no he cannot such questions is objected to by the adverse party will offend the first limb of section 142 of the evidence act the the classic decision is worki joseph versus state of kerala air 1993 supreme court 1892 air 1993 supreme court 1892 corresponding to 1993 criminal law journal 2010 2010 The judges are K. Ramaswamy and Aram Sahai. K. Ramaswamy being the author of the judgment. Now I will give you an illustration to make the position more clear. In a murder case, the deceased victim is one Vijay. Vijay was done away with, put an end. The accused is one Rajesh. According to the prosecution, P. W. Two is a prosecution witness. P. W. Two is a prosecution witness who is a person who came to the scene of occurrence on he. hearing the screams of the victim and on his rushing to the victim and asking him as to what happened the victim told him that rajesh stabbed him and ran away thereafter the victim succumbs to the fatal injuries sustained by him now during the trial of the case the public prosecutor asks pw2 the following question did not vijay die as a result of stabbing sustaining stab injury now this is an undisputed fact he died as a result of sustaining stab injuries accused also does not dispute that he only disputes his complicity he is alleged to rule yes here since it is an admitted case that vijay died as a result of sustaining stab injuries even though the question is a leading question it is admissible in view of the second limb of section 142 of the evidence act now the prosecutor asks another question Are you not an eyewitness to the occurrence in this case? The witness answers yes, but the question is objected to by the defence. But the court allows it. Here, the prosecution has no case that P. W. Two prosecution witness number two is an eyewitness. Their only case is that on hearing the screams of the deceased, P. W. Two came rushing and asked him what happened. By that time, the accused had run away and. therefore then he asked the it is actually a rest gesture the prosecutor the purpose of examining this witness is to prove a rest gesture uh, the statement by the wounded person that so and so stabbed him and ran away but the public prosecutor not only asked him a leading question but also spoiled the prosecution case by making pw2 more loyal than the king himself This is how a, a case can be spoiled by public prosecutors who do not um, study the case, who do not do the uh, required homework. Yes. Then yet another question is asked the, by the public prosecutor: When you ask, when you ask the wounded Vijay as to what happened, did he not tell you that Rajesh stabbed him? Answer is yes. The question is objected to by the defence, but the court allows it. Here also, this is undoubtedly a leading question since it was objected to by the defence. It should not have been admitted by the court in view of the first limb of section 142. The leading question should not be asked. He is putting the answer into the mouth of the witness. So that 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 uh, version of the witness or what he actually witnessed should come so much from the mouth of the witness, not by way of a leading question. Yes. Now we can read question number five. Uh, when the sessions court permits the public prosecutor 
even without any objection by the defense to put into the mouth of the prosecution witness leading questions in a chief examination suggesting answers which the public prosecutor wishes to get from the witness so as to connect the accused with the crime is the right to fair trial guaranteed by article 21 of the constitution of india breached vitiating the uh, uh, trial yes exactly even if the leading question which was not admissible is not objected to by the opposite party the court allows that leading question here technically strictly speaking there is no um, the law letter of the law is not is not violated but then what happens is it will it will impact on the the principle of fair trial guaranteed by article 21 so this will be a, 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 a case where the court would be justified in in intervening and uh, taking exception to that it was so held by the uh, to the bench in worki joseph versus state of kerala i have already given the citation ar 1993 supreme court uh, page 20 1892 now worki joseph was subsequently as mentioned by mr premraj was clarified in paragraphs 88 227 and 228 of manu sharma versus ncti of delhi 2010 6xcc page 1 6xcc page 1 uh, the judges are p sadashivam and swatantar kumar justice p sadashivam being the author of the judgment they 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 held that every leading question will not by itself invalidate the trial just because it is a leading question you can you cannot jump into the conclusion that it will invalidate the trial it all depends on the facts and circumstances of the case a leading question becomes inadmissible technically only if it is objected to by the adverse party yes question number 6 what is the evidentiary value of the testimony of a hostile prosecution witness who was not declared hostile and permission under section 154 of the evidence act was also not taken see when a party calls a witness he is his own witness and that witness turns hostile to the party itself instead of uh, supporting the version of the party the witness turns hostile becomes disloyal to the party then the oh, the option available to the party is to take the permission of the court under section 154 of the evidence act uh, uh, to to put questions which might be put in cross examination by the opposite party as i told you it is not cross examination but it is the questions which might be put in cross examination by the adverse party section 154 now uh, the uh, if it is a police charge case yet another permission is uh, necessary under the proviso to section 162 the the public if it is public prosecutor or if it is the uh, uh, the counsel appearing for the witness he will have to take one more permission uh, rather in a police charge case can only be the public prosecutor he will have to take apart from section 154 you have to take permission of the court under the proviso to section 162 of the crpc code of criminal procedure that is permission to put uh, to confront the witness with his 161 statements given to the police during investigation both these permission that is why the, the, the other day i was uh, reminding you of the uh, bad practice of judges writing in the deposition witness declared hostile no when a witness turns hostile he is turning hostile to the party who called him not to the accused or not to anybody else even not to the court therefore courts are not justified in writing witness turned hostile the the legally legal the legally correct way of putting uh, on paper in the deposition is that public prosecutor permitted under section 154 or public prosecutor granted permission under section 154 of the evidence act and under the proviso to section 162 1 crp is the legalistic way of putting things but in the uh, courts may not find time to put all these things i have seen magistrates write instead of writing cross examination putting a cross <laughs> to indicate that it is cross examination now uh, now supposing the witness turns hostile and the, the party 
does not call does not take permission under section 154 and does not put questions under section the the, the opposite party is entitled under 154 to put then the testimony of that party the prosecutor will have cannot disown he will have to go by the testimony of that party muktiya paragraphs 29 and 30 of muktiya ahmed ansari versus uh, ncit of delhi ar 2005 supreme court 2804 ar 2005 supreme court 2804 corresponding to 2005 volume 5 scc 258 2005 Volume Five, SCC Two Five Eight. Judges are B. N. Agrawal and C. K. Thakkar. The other being C. K. Thakkar. Again, in Rajaram vs. State of Rajasthan, Two Thousand Five. Volume Five, SCC Two Seven Two. Two Thousand Five. Volume Five, SCC Two Seven Two. The judges, judges are Judge K. T. Thomas and D. P. Mohanpatra. Again, Jawi Masood. ஜாவியன் summarizing the whole three sections is a beautiful decision by justice kt thomas as he then was of the kerala high court a leading question should not if objected to by the adverse party be asked in examination in chief or in re examination except with the permission of the court see former part of section 142 then court shall court shall permit leading questions as to matters which are introductory or undisputed or which have in the opinion of the court been already sufficiently proved in the case see the latter part of section 142 summing up the whole thing justice thomas formulated four questions, four proposition leading questions can be put even without the permission of the court during examination chief or re examination if the opposite party does not object to it if the opposite party does not object to it even during re examination or chief examination leading question can be put because the opposite party should have been vigilant if he has not if he was not vigilant leading questions can be put even without the permission of the court supposing the opposite party objects to the leading question then the court may or may not grant permission second proposition is need to obtain permission of the court to put leading question could arise only when the opposite party objects to it. the opposite party doesn't object question of asking for the permission of the court does in the rise then the proposition even if the opposite party objects court has a wide discretion in allowing leading questions to be put so just because the opposite party objects uh, it, there is no uh, mandate on the court to disallow leading question depending on the facts and circumstances of the case court may may or may allow or may not allow last proposition is with regard to matters covered by the latter part of section 142 court has no discretion but should allow leading question to be put 142 latter part court has no discretion no discretion in the matter court has to allow leading question introductory undisputed facts or matters which have already been proved leading questions should be allowed the citation is state of kerala versus vijayan elias rajan 1992 1 KLT 878, 1992, 1 KLT 878, corresponding to 1992, Kerala High Court cases 172. The division bench, Justice Thomas and Shamsuddin, Justice Thomas being the author of the judgment. With this, we conclude our uh, short webinar on leading questions. Uh, so we have a few questions. Yes. This is... please expand the little uh, expand a little on the law about the extent of uh, leading questions that can be asked to an approver and an expert approver approver and an expert okay. same principles same principle same guiding principles under section 141 to 142 143 will apply
Oh, the only exception is child witness. Child witness, as I said, court is the uh, in the is the guardian in the in the parent patriarch jurisdiction. Court has to safeguard the interests of the child witness. Therefore, when a child, when leading questions are put in cross examination, where the cross examiner is entitled in law to put leading questions, court may disallow that, saying that no, he is a child witness. You can't put leading questions. You put. Uh, uh, the question frame the reframe the question yes yes uh so this is the next question is can a leading question be asked about a statement with uh, which the court has declared as an improper admission uh, what is the law improper admission what is what is meant by improper admission leading question if objected to court will have to answer court will have to Decide then and there whether the leading question can, in the circumstances, case should be allowed or not. And regarding that, that as that stage of trial, the the view of the the verdict of the court will be binding. Of course, court of appeal can come to a different conclusion. Whenever a leading question is asked, the opposite side will will take exception to that, will object to that. Then it will be put in question answer form. The the trial judge has to put it in question answer form in the deposition paper, so that when the case comes up in appeal, and if the leading question was improperly admitted, the appellate court can decide whether the leading question was admitted properly or not. Yes. This this is by Kalasaru. What is the evidentiary value of admission to a leading question made by a prosecution witness during the cross examination of the prosecution under Section one fifty four CRPC? Cross examination. It is admissible. It is evidence. Leading question, by, even by the uh, a leading question, which is not permissible, even that is if not objected to, even that is evidence. The the party who called the witness, who turned unfriendly to that party, if leading questions are if uh, is not subjected to cross examination under one fifty four, then whatever the party says is binding on the party. On the witness says will be, will be binding on the party. Party cannot disown the statement of the witness if, without without permission, under one fifty four, the witness gives answers to the questions. Yeah. Uh, this is if during the daytime, this is by Nitika. If during the daytime, say eleven a.m., a lady is assaulted by some henchman hired by an accused and robbed of jewelry at her residence. She screamed for help, but no one came. No neighbors on the ground floor, and same floor were. The woman is residing. No witnesses to the incident. Can the sole testimony of the witness be relied upon? Why not? Why not? It has nothing to do with leading question. <laughs> This question has no has nothing to do with leading. Question so these are the questions. Question is not Pardon? that appears. Question appears to be whether a leading question can be good to that that you have been robbed by uh, the persons hired by the accused. No. No. If that, that is, was, if that I remember is, correct, the question that was put in the chat box was that: if the version of the accused is a total denial, leading can, questions cannot be put into the mouth of the witness. The question that was put was that whether uh, the, uh, the persons hired by the accused were the persons who attacked you and robbed. Yes, yes. <laughs> It has so to come else? from so motto from her mouth. Now next is. Uh, what about the leading questions to the victim in uh, uh, boxo cases? Boxo cases also there is a um, safeguard applied by courts. Courts straight away leading question cannot be asked. The court, the defense lawyer will have to frame the questions and put it to the court, and court will only uh, put the question. Uh, court in appropriate cases, court can reframe the question also. Anyway, this uh, law came into force. Only after my retirement. <laughs> yes, and uh, we are glad that Justice Ramakrishnan, also a former judge from Kerala High Court, has joined us. And uh, he'll be taking his session this weekend. So do stay connected with us. Oh, fine, wonderful. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay blessed, and thank you once again to Justice Ravi Ram Kumar for sharing his knowledge. and we will be always remain